we have been walking through the Bible since the beginning of this year. And each week we select a passage from our Bible reading and we use that as the focus of our weekly message. This past week, as we've been reading through the word, we read the end of Job, Job 32 to 42, Psalm 1 and 2, and Proverbs 1 through 6. If you want to join with us as we read through the Bible, we're going to be reading Proverbs 7 through 28. Proverbs 7 through 28. And you can find that Bible reading plan if you go to tworivers.church and the resources, there's a, it'll say Bible reading plans and you can just jump in and follow along in that reading plan along with us. There's so many resources that are connected to that. Today, as we talk about God's word, I want you to write down this message. You could use the back side of the brochure. There's notes. Today we're talking about what is the fear of the Lord? What is the fear of the Lord? Proverbs chapter 1 verse 7 says this. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of what? Everybody together, the beginning of knowledge. That was close. The, let's try that again. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. But fools despise wisdom and instruction. So as we go into this idea of what is the fear of the Lord, I, I think about one of my friends. I went to Bible College in Springfield, Missouri, and my wife went to Evangel University, and, and one of her friends was convinced that God was waiting to pounce, that in her life, everything that went wrong, everything that, that was a challenge, was because God was absolutely waiting to destroy her. And that she was actually living in fear of God. That, that God wasn't a loving God. God was someone who was looking to make her life miserable and make her life difficult. The flip side of that is I have friends while I was in Springfield and friends today who, as they view God, as they think about God, they, they have no fear of God whatsoever. They think of their sin as not a big deal. God's okay with it. Wink, wink. And what I find is interesting is both of these ideas of God are wrong. And, and, and most of us, as you think about your life, as you think about your father, as I think about some of my friends that I think about in their relationship with their earthly fathers, if their earthly father was a disciplinarian who was harsh, who was really strict, they tend to view God as a God who's a God to be feared. That I'm actually in fear of God. And then I have other friends whose fathers may have been absent or very permissive, never spoke up to say this is what's right or this is what's wrong. I'm your friend. And, and the fathers who their only ambition in life was to connect and, and I want you to tell me things, but I'll never tell you where your boundaries are. And they tend to view God as the God that winks at their sin. And, and so into all of that, we can tend to have a distorted understanding of what the fear of the Lord is. Because it depends on our family background of who we think God is around that because of our earthly father. And I want you to understand today that the fear of the Lord, according to Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7, is a gateway, it's a key that unlocks the favor of God in your life. When you begin to understand the fear of the Lord and function in the fear of the Lord, you begin to operate in blessing at a new level. And what happens is, the reason why the writer of Proverbs, Solomon, he's presenting this, this idea that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. That it's a foundation, it's a key. And, and if you don't understand the fear of the Lord in your own life, you won't be able to achieve the wisdom, you won't be able to achieve the benefits 
that God wants for your life until you come into a proper understanding of the fear of the Lord. And, and here's the foundation of what this looks like. Because God is loving, God is merciful, and God is forgiving. At the same time that God is loving, merciful, and forgiving, God is also holy and God is righteous. And so knowing that God, knowing God means accepting the fact that God's holiness and justice will cause him to judge sin. So, so when we talk about fearing God, the fear of the Lord, it means to be in awe of God's holiness. To give him complete reverence. To honor him as the God of great glory, majesty, purity, and power. In other words, it's saying, I stand in awe of him. Psalm 22, verse 23, has all of that sort of boiled down into a couple of different components. It says this, you who fear the Lord, here's the results of that. Here's what, this happen, here's what happens in your life. You who fear the Lord, praise him. You descendants of Jacob, honor him. Revere him. So the fear of the Lord is, is I recognize God at a higher level. I praise him. He's bigger than me. He's greater than me. I honor him because he's bigger than me. He's greater than me. And I revere him. He's bigger than me. He's greater than me. So the true fear of the Lord is going to cause you to place your faith and your trust in God alone for salvation. We talked about the Israelites facing the Red Sea today. Exodus chapter 14, verse 31. It says that when the Israelites saw the mighty hand of the Lord displayed against the Egyptians, the people what? Everybody together? The people... Come on, what happened? The people feared the Lord. And because they feared the Lord, they, they saw him with awe. They saw him reverence. They just saw him part the Red Sea. They saw him kill all the Egyptians who were chasing them. They put their trust in him. It's interesting to me that if the fear of the Lord was, I'm afraid of God, in that moment, would you put your trust in him? Or would you say, no, nah, I don't want anything to do with him? The fear of the Lord goes beyond, I'm afraid of God, to, I reference God, I want to obey God, I want to do what God says, and I recognize that he loves me. That he's working on my behalf. He's greater than me, yet he still cares for me. And that puts us in a position where we put our trust in him. So to fear God involves recognizing that he's angry about sin. We don't often talk about in the church the fact that God is angry about sin. But when your own children and they're engaged in activities that are gonna be destructive to them. And you see, if your child is playing in the road, what's gonna happen? Somebody, somebody comment online. If you're, if you're in the room, you can go to the, the YouTube chat and just chat, please, and tell me what's gonna to happen to some child playing in the road. They're gonna get hit by a car, it's gonna kill them. Now, should I be like, wow, this is wonderful. Look at how free my children are. Look how great it is. No. And, and if someone told my child, it's wonderful to play in the street, what you going to do to that person? I'm going to break them. Who are you trying to kill my children? It's my job to crush you now. God's given me authority to protect my kids, and I'm going to break you. Your voice will never be in my child's life. It's like ab absolutely God, when he sees your life, 
and he sees the enemy trying to pollute your life. Because sin isn't the best things in life. Sometimes we've believed that sin is like, oh, God's trying to keep me from all the good stuff. God's trying to keep you from the things that are going to destroy you. God's not a cosmic killjoy. God is trying to maximize your joy. God is trying to maximize your peace. God is trying to maximize in your life wonder. He's trying to maximize in your life purity. He's trying to maximize in your life the things that are going to be a blessing to you. And what happens is we're, we're, we're like sheep, and we will continuously, like, oh, there's a sheep jumped off the cliff. That seemed like a good idea. Let me go jump off the cliff. Uh, he sounded like he was having fun on his way down. We get tricked, and so God is absolutely angry at sin. And he has the power to punish those who stand arrogantly against him and break his laws. Why would God punish those who are arrogantly standing against him? Because he loves us enough to discipline us. He loves us enough to say, don't play in the road. Now we have a concept of freedom where we, we try to chafe against the discipline of God. And one of the best ways that I like to describe this is the idea that in our culture today, we think of freedom as the lack of restriction. But we are probably more like the analogy of a train on tracks. And let me ask you this. When is a train most free? When the train is on the tracks or when it's off the tracks? Come on, shout it out. When it's on the tracks. Is that what I heard? Why is it that the train is the most free when it's operating with only these two rails. It has this tremendous restriction. It can only go where the rails are, but the reason is when a train goes off the tracks, what do we call that? A train crash. The thing is only free when it's doing what it was created to do. You and I are only free when we're able to function inside of the boundaries that God's created. And he didn't create these boundaries to keep us from the great things. He, ca he gave us these boundaries to keep us from crashing. That we operate best inside of God's plan, in God, inside of God's system. And so it is God's prerogative to because he loves us, because he's holy, because he's just, to say, yes, I'm angry with anyone who tries to destroy what I've created, what I said is good. And so we can have a tortured relationship with that because sometimes we have a tortured relationship with authority. We have a tortured relationship with our own fathers who maybe never said, hey, Stay inside of these boundaries because this is what's best. Or we have fathers who said, these are all the boundaries and, and these are all the, and you can never breathe, you can't, and, and they're just trying to micromanage. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 31 actually says it like this. It's a terrible thing to fall into the hands of a living God. That God actually will punish to redirect our lives. A great example of this is Jim Baker. Jim Baker, if you don't know, was in the 80s one of the most successful evangelists. He was on TV and, and he was on fire for God. Yet, at the same time, it was revealed that Jim Baker was having an affair with his secretary. And it's so twisted that his staff members, because of his tortured relationship with his wife, his staff members were encouraging that affair. On top of that, they had engaged in a scheme of embezzlement. They had engaged in a scheme that was illegally channeling money in, in, in ways that were absolutely underhanded. And they knew they were doing it. 
And so into that, Jim Baker was exposed, and Jim Baker went to jail, went to prison for all of his crimes. And while he was in prison, John Bevere came to visit him. John Bevere is another pastor. And John Bevere tells the story of coming to visit Jim Baker in prison. And John Bevere walks through the prison doors, and, and Jim Baker hugged him. So glad you're here, Pastor John. So lovely. And, and as John Bevere began to talk with Jim Baker, Jim Baker said, this was, this was the mercy of God in my life for me to go to prison. He didn't view prison as the destruction of his life. He viewed prison as God's hand of mercy. And John Bevere's like, what do you mean? And Jim Baker said, if I'd continued going down the road that I was going down, I would have lost my soul. That actually God putting me in prison was the best thing that could happen because it's caused me to humble my life. It's caused me to repent. It's caused me to understand how wayward I was headed. John Bevere was stunned by Jim Baker's understanding of the mercy of God. John Bevere asked him, he said, Jim, you used to be so on fire for God. When did you stop loving God? When was it that, that you stopped honoring God? Was it when you started having the affair seven years before you started embezzling? Was it when you started the embezzlement scheme and the, and the financial mishandling? And Jim Baker says something that's so profound. He said, I never stopped loving God. In the middle of all the sin, in the middle of everything that he was doing, Jim Baker said, I, I never stopped loving God, but I stopped fearing God. I did not fear the Lord. And this is the moment in Jim Baker's life where he recognized that the hand of God was in his life correcting him and he experienced the correction of God as mercy. But the fear of God in your life goes beyond I recognize in my life that I need correction. Because as we finished up the book of Job, Job is justifying himself and he's saying, God, I'm sinless. I've done nothing wrong. And on top of that, now I'm calling you into question, God. How dare you, God, do something in my life because I'm so good. And the Bible says that he was. And all throughout the book of Job, the question that's never answered because Job says, God, how can you be just if you do these things to me? That actually in your life and in my life, we can come into moments where there's things that are happening that it's not fair. And it's not right. And it's not good. And we can question God. And God answers Job. But God doesn't apologize and say, Job, I'm so sorry these bad things happened to you. God causes Job to acknowledge that God himself is great, that God is powerful, that God is high above. And Job humbles himself before God. So I want you to see this in the scriptures. It says in Job chapter 38, verse one. Then the Lord spoke to Job out of the storm and he said, who is this that obscures my plans with words without knowledge? What does the fear of the Lord bring? Come on, everybody. What does the fear of the Lord bring? Knowledge. knowledge. It, it begins to unlock knowledge. And this is a wisdom that's different than the wisdom of this world. There are many scientists today who have explored things, that, that have delved into things. They have knowledge. But there's true knowledge because every one of us at some point will die. Every one of us at some point will come to the end of this life. In the knowledge that we have, was it true knowledge? Was it the knowledge that changed? And so, so God says to Job, hey, who is it that obscures my plans with words without knowledge? Brace yourself like a man. Like Job, I'm about to give you some. I'm going to question you and you're going to answer me. In Job 38 verse 4, he says, where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? 
tell me if you understand. In other words, God is saying, look, I put all of this together. You and I, we're not the same. You're trying to try me in a court of appeals, and I don't, I'm not qualified for your court. I'm bigger than you. Job, were you there when I laid down the foundations of the universe? Like even to this day, scientists can't understand how do atoms hold together? How do molecules hold together? Why, when my hand is full of molecules, when I touch this table, which is also molecules, why don't, why don't my molecules merge together? What keeps my hands separate fundamentally from the table? What's going on with gravity? What's going on? How, how, are the, how is life spontaneously generated? How did the universe spontaneously generate? These are questions. We have developed a tremendous amount of understanding, but we have not even begun to scrape into the nature of what God could do when he simply spoke and all things came into existence. And the order of the universe and the absolute majesty and awe of everything that God's created. And we try to take this God and hold him to our account. Job 40 verse 2 says, who will contend? Will the one who contends with the Almighty correct him? Let him who accuses God answer him. Verse 8, would you discredit my justice? Would you condemn me and justify yourself? And that's where I find myself. I want to, I want to say to God, God, you didn't do things my way. And now I'm upset with you, God, because things don't go the way I want them to go. And I want to condemn him, and I want to justify myself. God, I, I was justified in my sin because I felt this way. I felt like doing it. I felt like it was okay. And it's not fair that you created me this way and I have these temptations and now you're telling me that I can't give in to these temptations. And what God says to Job, he says, Job, you and I, we're not the same. I'm not dancing to your song. And one of the things we discover about the fear of God reflected through the eyes of Job, it's more than that God just corrects us and disciplines us. That God is so much bigger. He is so much greater. He is so much more majestic. He is so much more other. He is so much more beyond. He is a God that fills the heavens and the earth. He's a God that spoke and everything came into existence. And we try to bring God to our level. And the fear of God says, I need to keep you at a level in my eyes where you are holy, you're awesome, you're wonderful, you're, you're majestic, you are beyond me. And I acknowledge you as the creator of the universe and you and I are on different levels. And at the end of all of this, Job comes to the place where he fears God. Job, the Bible says, was righteous. Job was distressed. And ultimately, Job bows before God that is great, He's awesome, he's powerful, and he's beyond the depths of our understanding. So with our time together, how should we fear God? Number one, obey his commands. Obey his commands. That you and I are created. God has a path to life, and he wants the best for us. And if we're gonna fear him, the Bible says that we've got to obey him. John chapter 15 says, abide in me and I'll abide in you and you'll bear much fruit, fruit that will last. Anybody who loves me, obeys me. If you love God, you obey God. And, and the obedience to God is a sign of our fear of God. 
to Psalm chapter 112, verse 1. It says, praise the Lord. Blessed are those who fear the Lord, who find great delight in his commands. That actually you and I, we're, we're at war with God, our internal soul. We are in a position where our inner man is at war with the good things that God has said. When I see the law, I can recognize that the law has benefits, but in me, I despise it. I want to throw off, like the train, I want to throw off the train tracks. And at some point, I've believed a lie that says my freedom comes when I can get rid of these restrictions in my life. And to fear the Lord is simply that we would obey his commands. Number two, we're going to teach our children to obey God. This is what it means to fear the Lord. Verse, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 9 says it like this. Only be careful and watch yourselves closely so that you don't forget the things your eyes have seen or let them fade from your heart as long as you live. Teach them to your children and to their children after them. Now, parents, we all understand, be careful. Moms of little children, especially first-time moms, when you go to the playground, here's how I know when I'm at the playground, I can tell who first-time moms are. How, here's how you know. Their children are up on the playground, and mom is hovering directly below. They're saying, be careful. Be careful. Be careful. And, and moms are truly stressed out at the playground. How many moms in the room, you've been straight stressed at the playground? Y'all are going to kill me. You, you don't, like, I want my children to play, but be careful. And children have this innate thing, like, I want to, I, I don't want to just slide down the slide, like if it's the tube slide, I'm going to get on top of the tube at the highest height, and I'm going to straddle it, and, there's, and it's 30 feet in the air, and what goes through a mom's mind is, my child's about to die, I'm a terrible mother, I've ruined their life, and they're sitting supremely happy at the top of 30 feet, straddling the, 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 the tube that goes down as a slide, and what do you want to scream? Be careful! And this is God saying to us, be careful. There's something that's dangerous in your life. There's something that could harm you, something that could hurt you. And I want you to take everything that you've learned. I want you to experience the goodness of God, all of the things that God does in your life. And I want you to teach to your children like your children don't just get to decide, okay, today I'm not going to go to church. No, you're going to church. You know why you're going to church? Because God said that i got to be careful to teach you these things. I'm going to instruct you in these things. And, and there's something that has to happen in your life. And, of course, that's why we say we don't want to take our kids to church. And we want our children to have a wonderful children's environment. It's terrible that, like, oh, it has to be that when we go to church, it's a life-giving church. It shouldn't be punishment to go to church, and it also shouldn't be punishment. I see this sometimes. Parents disciplining their kids by restricting them from going to church because they like it so much. i got to do something to punish my children. And they like church, so we're not going to let them go to church. Find another option. Number three, we'll have the worship team come back here. To fear God, this is what it is, to fear God. Worship God with your whole being. Worship God with your whole being. It says in Psalm 22, verse 23, we already read this verse, but we're going to leave it at this verse. It says, you who fear the Lord, everybody together, you who fear the Lord, praise him. Now, that means that if I fear the Lord, I'm going all in. You know what happens in my life as I, I worship the Lord? 
sometimes I start thinking about what other people are thinking about me. What's so-and-so going to think if I put my hand in the air? What's so-and-so going to think when they walk out of here? Anybody ever been there where, where in your moment of praising God, you've felt like you wondered what somebody else might think? Three people. Y'all are some free people. Come on, this is a crowd participant. Write it on, online. Somebody, you got to put, look, I, I have, in the culture that I live in, I feel tremendous pressure. I can't be the only one that I feel pressure to conform to what other people are doing. I feel pressure. I feel like people are watching me and they want me to live like them. And when we say we're going to worship the Lord with our whole being, it means that when I fear God and I go to worship him, I'm only thinking about him. I'm not, I'm not trying to worry about pleasing you when I worship the Lord. I'm not trying to worry about pleasing my neighbors when I'm worshiping the Lord. Like when I go to a basketball game, I'm that guy. I am. I'm the guy. Like they send emails from the school to address parents like me. Like it's my, one of the things I love to do is to get after the refs. Where's Glenn? I'm going to get you, bro. Glenn's a, Glenn's a referee in the basketball games, and, and Glenn might get the call right, and I'm going to put pressure on him just because on the next call, I want him to call it in favor of my team. That's how I roll. Get off me, ref. Get some glasses. Let's go, team. I'm about that life. And, if, and, and, and my reality is, the way that your personality is, if you got a personality like mine, go for it. If you're quiet, worship the Lord, quiet, but do it hardcore. Like I'm a hardcore quiet worshiper. In my heart, I'm going nuts for Jesus. And, and just, I'm writing poems right now. And I'm in my heart. I don't know how. I, I got to talk. I got to. That's my role. But, but the point of it is, if you're going to fear God, don't let anything keep you from praising him with your whole being. Don't let anything keep you from honoring him with all that you have. Don't let anything keep you from revering him. That God, if I fear God, I've replaced Everything. I'm serving God and God alone. I, everything else gets pushed out of my life, and this is what I do from here on out. I want to pray for you. Jesus, I pray now that, that you would come and you fix our understanding of who you are. That our Heavenly Father loves us and is holy. That we don't have to be afraid of you, but that we can fear you. We can reverence you. We can obey you. We can live in light of your correction and your direction, understanding that you are God above. And in that, as we do that, your word is full of promises that you're going to bless us. You're going to take care of us. There's things that are coming to us because we fear you and we honor you. Speak to every heart and every life. Now in Jesus' name, amen.